Okay, you're listening to Man Slipscomb uh, on RAG Radio. Uh, I'm Thorne Dreyer, uh, and uh, my guests are Chris Strockwitz, uh, legendary Roots and Music music produce, Roots and Blues music producer, founder of Our Hooli Records, uh, and filmmakers Maureen Gosling and Chris Simon, whose This Ain't Mouse music premiered at uh, you know, with several screenings at the uh, at South by Southwest Film Festival uh, this week in Austin, Texas, uh, and I it's. It's a remarkable film. Um, you guys, everybody worked with Les Blank. Yes. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. I had some, we have some fan mail. I always end up reading some fan mail during the show and for, you know, and questions that people send in. And I, Fontaine Maverick said, uh, I would love to hear about Strockwitz's collaboration with, with Les, who inspired, who inspired whom and so forth. But I'd like to hear that from all of you. All right. <laughs> well, you can start. I mean, it's actually their movie, you know, and I'm sort of a hog on the microphone sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, it started, I guess, when I saw him editing or wanting to meet, uh, I think, Lightning or Mance anyway. And then I watched him as he was editing that thing and the Mance Lipscomb film, I think, which is called, uh, do you remember? A Well-Spent well well Life. A Well-Spent Life. Yeah, I think that's his classic to my uh, humble ears, but anyway, I really loved the work he did, and so when I discovered that there were people filming blues and jazz and country music all over the place, nobody was doing anything about documenting this incredibly rich Mexican-American border music, and so I just scraped together my savings at that particular time, and Les devoted all his equipment, and the two of us basically went around South Texas on two different trips and finally uh, came out with uh, Chula's Fronteras. And uh, it was a, a hard job, but an enjoyable one. I was sort of the song and dance man who, who arranged for the musicians <laughs> to come around yeah. and to make sure to come to certain parties, but Les was also good at it. And he did all the sound, all the lights and the camera work. and. I did the sound and hopping around. Another message that we got was from Bruce David Johnson, and I don't can't speak to the accuracy of this, but he says, Foxy Maureen made great progress from lettering the subtitles of Les Blank's films about Clifton Chenier to being a filmmaker. I don't know if that's, if that's how you start out, but tell us about, because you both worked with, with uh, Les Blank for, for decades. How did you get into this business, and how much, info, and how much did you get out of, get from him. Oh, well, Les was my mentor. I graduated from University of Michigan with a degree in social anthropology, and I had gotten really interested in foreign films at that point. And when I realized you could make films about people and culture, I, I really got excited because I'd never thought about filmmaking as a career. But I ended up at this anthropological film festival, and he showed, I think, three of his films. And for I got my nerve up to talk to him at a party for like 10 minutes. And I just, I didn't even think to ask for a job at that point because I didn't even think about that possibility. But um, he started writing me letters and, and pretty soon I, I said, oh, well, if you ever need an assistant, let me know. So about nine months after this uh, first film festival, I was heading off to Hollywood to drive to uh, Black French Louisiana, which ended up to be the film Dry Wood and Hot Pepper. And I literally, the first day of filming was the first day I'd really carried a Nagra tape recorder around and microphone. And the same day we were mixing sound at a dance at night. And <laughs> luckily there was a guy with him that was kind of helping out for a little while and he helped me uh, learn how to do that. And I just hit, had to hit the ground running. We, Les and I, those guys left and it was just less than me for about a couple of months, and we filmed and hung around in black French dance halls and, and met some Cajuns, too, in, in um, like Marc Savoie and Lafayette, and I knew I couldn't turn back. It was like the beginning of some other world, and um, I ended up working with Les for 20 years, and we made some amazing films together, and Chris Simon came along, and you can tell your story. <laughs> Chris Simon. That was Ma Maureen Gosling, now Chris Simon. Well, mine's a little more personal. I, you know, I'm a folklorist, and I love this kind of subject. And I moved next door to Les, and pretty soon I was dating Les, and then I moved in with him, 
And then it became obvious that if I didn't start working with him, I was never going to see the guy. <laughs> so I, and I, like Maureen, learned on the job, and I did everything from producing to distribution to sound, editing, et cetera. And I lasted 20 years, too. It's, 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 uh, the, what, one of the things that I said the movie does so beautifully is present. How much of the music in the film, how much of that was shot for the film? How much was it shot, was it archival? Uh, how much was it stuff uh, that Chris had? How did, where did you get all the music and, and how did you put all that together? Well, I think we need to figure out a percentage because people have asked us that. Uh -huh. um, but maybe about a third, of, or 25 to 30% maybe was archival. And um, a lot of recordings that Chris did, just, you know, his recordings are played under things and around things. And then we recorded a lot of stuff live, uh, filmed a lot of things live, like the Treme Brass Band in New Orleans, uh, Michael and David Doucet performing together, uh, the No Speed Limit uh, Bluegrass Band in um, Virginia, and Cajun. Cajun, I mean the Savoie Family Band, Wilson Savoie and the Pine Leaf Boys, and um, Santiago Jimenez Jr. here in, in Texas, as well as Flaco Jimenez. And, Many, many others. It was wonderful to see oh, Big Mama Thornton singing uh, Hound Dog. There's so many people out there who still think that, you know, that, that Hound Dog started with Elvis Presley. Uh, and we used to see Big Mama used to play Liberty Hall uh, in Houston. It was, she was just incredible. Uh, uh, Chris Strockwitz, tell us something, because the, the, your work and the film, because the film, it seemed to me, followed the, kind of the evolution to a great extent of, of your scouting uh, if you're sleuthing of musicians, and I mean, we went to, we went from Man Slipscomb, Lightning Hopkins, Man Slipscomb, then we went to Clifton Chenier, we went to, to Zydeco music uh, and, and Cajun music, and we went to Bluegrass out in the... Uh, tell us about how that process happened and how you managed to, to track down all this great music. I guess I'm just a root and groundhog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I can't find musicians, I hunt records, you know, wherever I go, and I just... Uh, I should have probably opened a detective agency <laughs> instead of this. But anyway, I was lucky really to make uh, fairly decent money with the publishing. When the Rolling Stones recorded, you know, you got to move and finally recognize that Fred McDowell was the, I mean, it took some legal shenanigans, but that is amazing what a song can do for you if it's copied by a lot of other musicians from Japan to Australia and on and on it goes and they constantly are using that uh, particular version of it. <laughs> I won't go into any further details about it but anyway that helped me make a living really this the publishing that still uh, kind of keeps me going at this time because the whole record business as we knew it you know has pretty much gone down the rat hole and in those days, I was really just constantly meeting people and so on, but I never had any money sort of to make my own record of Big Mama Thornton. I used to see, I remember visiting Bob Geddens in Oakland. He was a legendary, really, R&B record producer in the 50s and so on, 60s. And I saw this huge shape laying on this couch there, and I asked Bob, who's that sleeping over there on your couch? He said, that's Big Mama Thornton. <laughs> I said, oh, wow. So I <laughs> and I started talking again to her. I'd seen her once at a little dive in Santa Cruz on the boardwalk where she was behind the drums, and she had her harmonica and a glass of water on the windowsill, and she was just working those drums. And she had a piano player with her, and she at first had a guitar player too, but he got too drunk and disappeared. <laughs> so when I saw her, she said, that's the two of them. Anyway, you know, and, and then Horst Lippmann, who produced the American Folk Blues Festival that toured Europe for many, many years back in the 60s and 70s, he wanted her on a, on a tour. And so uh, it was really no problem getting her to, to go because, like she said in the film, you know, that, <laughs> that, that dog played out and I need another <laughs> dog. <you know? laughs> it, was, it was wonderful because you talked about it, and this was especially true with, when you were looking for Lightning Hopkins. Yeah. But when you, lots of these musicians, you said, you, you didn't go to some venue to see them. You know, you went to some little beer hall that didn't have a stage. Uh, you know, I mean, it was, 
Even in California, that was the case, you know, especially with black musicians trying to make a living somewhere. I heard Mercy D, the great Texas blues pianist who made One Room Country Shack and that stuff of stuff. I heard him at a bar halfway between Santa Cruz and what's the next town south of there? It's a, uh, I forgot. Anyway, and there he was with a turban around his head trying to play contemporary piano. Of course, the first note I heard by him, I knew who he was, you know. It, oh God, it was... It, you know, it's, it's a tough life to come from the fields and play for the white folks. <laughs> okay, it's, it, you, a, lot of, a lot of the people that are in this film, the film is uh, This Ain't No Mouse Music, uh, a lot of the people are gone or will be gone soon. I mean, these are, these are old school folks who many, of, many people listening have never had the, the delight, the pleasure to, to hear. Uh, or at least only heard, have heard in their later days. You also, though, went to the, you get found bluegrass in Appalachia. There, there's a group called No Speed Limit, which is like a new generation where you're, you're finding something that carries, it, it, it's a culture where that carries on in the families, right? That carries on in the community. Uh, and, and there's a lot of, there's some, there's some cultures where that's not happening, where stuff is dying. Well, I was but at this uh, uh, folk festival in, in Virginia, in Richmond, uh, which uh, the NCTA has been putting on for several years, and I got to know their uh, guiding director, Joe Wilson, and he invited me to come down there because I wanted to visit Appalachia, and so I think it was a good time to take these two ladies who wanted to make this movie. This is going to be a great trip because I love that whole area. I hadn't been there in, in long time, in 40 or 50 years almost. And um, so at this festival, here was this group with this young girl singer, she just totally knocked me on my rear. I mean, it was just unbelievable. She had this energy and this, and the quality to her voice. I know people who say, well, he's slightly out of tune. Well, the hell with that. <laughs> most, most good music to my ears is slightly edgy, you know? <laughs> <It's> a... <laughs> okay, well, I think we have a clip, don't we, Tracy? Let's hear that. And I pull the trigger. tradition behind you know if you've got your heart and soul behind it you've got the instruments you've got the heart and the lyrics it's going to have that traditional element to it whether it sounds rockish or jazzy or blues or country and I love it I love pushing the border we push it all the time <laughs> sometimes we push it a little further than than your typical crowd would like <laughs> but we like it <laughs> Okay, I'm Thorne Dreyer. This is Rag Radio. My guests are um, Chris Strockwitz, uh, legendary founder of Arhuli Records, uh, Maureen Gosling and Chris Simon, who've made a terrific movie that's uh, premiered at South by Southwest this week uh, called This Ain't No Mouse Music. Uh, and it's about uh, Chris's story and the story of Arhuli Records. Um, you guys have... You went like went to New Orleans. You went to a bunch of places. How many places did you go? And how was how was that? I think New Orleans was a was a trip. Certainly, that was a one, that was a wonderful segment in the in the in the movie. Chris. Well, New Orleans was a trip, and um, it also was something of a disaster, which you don't see in the film. <laughs> it um, that whole wonderful session with the Treme Brass Band. We were filming out in a beautiful open area. I mean, it looked great. It sounded great. It was incredible. And at the end, just when we were all congratulating ourselves on the brilliance of our vision, <laughs> the sound recorders came up and said, the computer just crashed. We lost everything. Computer crashed? I've never heard of that. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, that was it. Yeah. Was it was quite a few years ago, so it was actually new to us all. But the computer crashed. We thought we lost everything. It was a huge trauma, and you know, we pieced stuff together for the film, but. Um, you know, we never thought we'd see anything again. And then one day, David called us five years later and said, guess what? It was still on the hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> so we were able to put it all in the film. Yeah. But without that story, because poor David was really didn't want that shown. <laughs> Chris didn't either, actually. <laughs> so where else did you go? That you actually went out and did location shooting? Well, we filmed at the... Uh, Savoy family annual boucherie, which is always really fun. And that's just a perfect setting for the music because it's, it's just people jamming and eating and having a good time. And it's a beautiful way to see the music in the context of the culture and not just set up on a stage. We actually wanted to have a variety of settings for the music because musicians play in all kinds of situations. So we do have you know musicians playing at folk festivals, backyards, uh, a few set up, sort of set up um, sessions, and so forth. Uh, we filmed in, uh, in San Antonio, actually Chris Simon and, and the gang went, I didn't make it to that one, but they were filmed all around in San Antonio and also Eagle Pass and where else? Yeah, Navasota. We went down to Navasota, talked to um, Mance's grandson, I mean, a lot of this stuff is you're going to have to wait for the extras. In yeah, the I was going to say that you right, wanted the things. Not necessarily in there. And well, then ultimately went to Appalachia. How much did you, I mean, because you had to, you said that one of the tragic things, and it's always a tragic thing about making a movie like this, is all the stuff that's on the cutting room floor. Uh, well, I calculated that it was roughly 120 hours, and that does include a lot of um, two camera shoots, two or three camera shoots of music. So if you, you know, got rid of the double cameras, the actual hours of content probably was more like 90 or something. But still, that's huge, especially with some, you know, you're, we're filming whole sets of musicians, and sometimes there's a whole lot of good music in those sets. So there's a lot of that that we, you know, it was hard to cut out. We it was like cutting off your finger and your toe to take out this stuff. And so we hope that we'll have other ways f to get it out in the world. Will the DVD have directors? Uh, will it have uh, outtakes, cuts? To... Yeah, YouTube videos, outtake, uh, outtakes on the DVD, and who knows what else, maybe part two. Is there a way? When, when do you expect a DVD to to come out or do you have any know anything about distribution or any other yeah we don't have a distributor yet I mean if we end up self distributing <coughs> it'll probably be out in about a year we, we want to take some time and make sure we exploit the opportunities to get this out to the widest number of people but there will be a DVD and there will be probably you know an hour and a half of film and six hours of extras <laughs> man it's tragic if uh, anybody who doesn't get to see this because it's just it's truly wonderful uh, I'm Thorne Dreyer this is Rag Radio uh, we'll be right back <laughs> 